Good evening and welcome to your Sassy Business PM. My name is Prince Moses. Tonight we will be discussing the introduction of technology in electoral processes here in Ghana and across the globe. The introduction of ICT, that is, information and communications technologies into the electoral processes generating both interest and concern among voters as well as practitioners across the globe. Today, most electoral management bodies, that is EMBs, around the world use new technologies with the aim of improving the electoral process making it less cumbersome and faster. Now, these technologies range from the use of basic office automation tools such as word processing and spreadsheets like Excel, which most of you um, have come to get acquainted with over the years. And um, we have moved on to more sophisticated data processing tools such as database management systems, optical scanning and geographic information systems. One especially important application of technology to elections is e-voting and um, the use of electronic technology is also casting um, or counting votes. Now e-voting has many uses including increasing participation among voters abroad and making elections more inclusive for voters with disabilities. Some countries, especially in Europe, began piloting e-voting in one way or another about a decade ago. While these technologies open up new frontiers and offer new possibilities for the electoral process, especially for voting operations, there may be unforeseen risks involved, such as an increase in vote selling or difficulty in auditing election results due to a lack of physical proof, like ballot papers, as we're used to. Now, careful consideration also needs to be given to the risks of inappropriate or untimely introduction of technology, especially if it has the potential to compromise transparency, local ownership or sustainability of the electoral process and about the problems, we have not even touched the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Hacking. So tonight, we are going to be talking to three gentlemen in the studio. And um, they're very well known. They are our panelists. When we come back, I'll introduce them. If you just tuned in tonight on Tech and Innovation Monday, we're talking about election tech with our usual panelists, Oswald Anunadaga, CEO of Floodgates Limited, which is into um, what? Tell me what you do. Feature of work solutions, uh, cyber security solutions, data and identity solutions. Wonderful. And then we also have with us Josiah Ayerson, CEO of iSpace Foundation. What do you do, Josiah? We work with entrepreneurs providing a conducive environment and um, support with the ideas we also, stuff. Oh, we also have Felix Darko, who's in his Uber, rushing here like lighting and... Um, um, he's also a tech expert, and uh, we will be talking to him when he gets here. We're talking about election technology. All right, so I ended up my, my, my brief presentation with hacking. Yeah, so we see a lot of countries departing from the, 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 that anguma, as we say in French, or that extreme um, desire to use biometrics in their electioneering. And uh, we're seeing that in Ghana as well. You know, people are not quite enthused, countries, that is, are not quite enthused about election technology these days. And why is that? Hacking, I'm sure. Oswald. Yeah. So basically, once you can build something, you can break it. And sometimes it boils down to how difficult it is to break it, actually. And so most of these systems, uh, there have been advances in... in uh, cryptography and encryption which helps to secure these devices but previously you know because elections are held every four years 
sometimes um, we've not had some of this very solid technology for a very long time. And so people are afraid that, oh, what about if these devices are hacked, new devices come in. But I think that in 2020, they are, they are, it's actually um, secure, much easier for us to look at now, looking at going electronic voting the whole way, maybe in 2024. And there are also other ways that um, you can hack an election without actually tampering with the devices as well. Yeah, ah. uh, yeah. that's with, by tampering with people's minds and technology has given us the ability to <laughs> be able to do that. Just sorry, what did you say to that? I, kn I knew he was going there. <laughs> I knew he was going there. I mean, I think this whole hacking thing, right, um, is a bit of a touch and go. It always seems like the loser always says something has been hacked, right? And um, you're right, you're right by saying when something is built, it can be broken. But then when we say every election is four years, it isn't. It's every two years. Right, national elections would be for four years, but you know when you do your normal elections, they test it out two years yeah, and yeah, then yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so the system they already know the flaws in the system before they make it national. And if we in a nation that don't build our own technology, yeah. then we shouldn't be surprised if somebody else is hacking it, yeah, right? Because and we're getting it from somewhere, somewhere else, and so that right? somewhere else might have. Um, uh, the cause, right? The, yeah. You know, yeah. And I mean, you talked about all the crypto. I mean, when you look at blockchain, yeah. That can be another way that they can use to kind of exactly. ensure that that's these what, things That's what I was saying. Right? Now we have reached that place. We have um, blockchain, right. which we can actually apply in elections. And so we need to solve the issue of identity first. We have an issue with identity mm -hmm. before we talk about the security of the devices of the right. election. Okay, look, um, let's be a bit more didactic. To people like me who are who have some understanding of tech but not, are not experts, you're talking about blockchain and how it could help resolve some of these um, issues around um, election, um, it, it, you know, e-voting, mm -hmm. All right? How does it help? And what is um, blockchain anyway? Yeah, I'll let the expert talk about uh, really, it. Really, I was yeah. going to let, let you have that one. So um, it's a technology that um, works. Let me just describe it like raw. So let's say that all of us have ledgers and then and a, and a paper. So whenever there's a record of something and I want to do something, I need to verify from both of you to confirm and each of you has to confirm before I am able to execute it and then you save the record and when anyone else wants to do something that's how it works so basically the blockchain is technology that works like that the most popular application is in Bitcoin. so there is some sort of verification yeah. from, verification from yeah. um, your peer to peer your peers service yeah. you know, so for you to progress service. to the next level one yeah. person had to verify it you send a message this way I verify it before yeah. you can move right yeah. so okay. without that there's nothing happening Okay, yeah. Yeah. so it's a bit like what I get when I'm, um, I'm trying to log back into my Gmail, for instance, where I have to confirm with my ID and some other ID and some in another way, but yeah. this time yeah. with right. other and people. Right, in a basic format, of, I guess. Yeah, that, that, right? that, yeah. that's basically the idea is similar mm -hmm. to that, but that's multi-factor authentication, which means that you are going through different levels of verification before you get there. Mm -hmm. um, blockchain deals mostly with peer-to-peer -peer, um, verification and authorization. Using the same framework. Use, yes, similar, similar. So uh, with blockchain, for example, let's say we have, you, you can apply it in land, so let's say that land documents, everyone, five people can be holding some kind of documents on land and probably one, only one of them is authentic or real or acceptable. But if we had blockchain and we're applying that, that wouldn't have to be the case because when one person has it and then you're going to do a transaction, all the other servers will have to verify that this is actually free, this is available before you can create another um, uh, set of documents for, an, uh, for the second person. And so you help to eliminate a lot of those issues. And that's how Bitcoin runs. And we are talking about a, a transaction where if you need to do a transaction, it must be verified by a number of servers and peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, systems on the platform before you can proceed with your transaction. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you were saying that, Josiah, you said it. You said that when people lose elections, they tend to say that there was this problem and there was that right. problem. But then in 2016 in the U.S., we knew there was some meddling, yeah. you know, and these were authenticated and confirmed by the highest offices, mm -hmm. right? We had the same issues in France and some attempts in some other very industrialized countries right. where some very high offices actually admitted to election meddling from other countries, from third 
parties. And um, there must, I mean, you, 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 you can't, I believe you can't just say that because this technology was not made here. We do not have um, a full scope of how to prevent um, hacking, for instance, because I'm sure Americans built their systems and yet people from other countries were able to get into right. those systems yeah, yeah. yeah i mean but then you see there are real issues around e-voting right but the issues here again the companies that build these systems are not owned by the government they're independent companies right yeah. see so the highest bidder and if we write the codes and give it to a nation to use as a uh, elections and we have a reason why we want one person to win we can hack it ourselves right see so these things are going to happen so my answer to that is let's go back to the days where we used to use marbles which is what is happening now because i know that is what the u.s did mm -hmm. they have i mean i think um dominion e or something e yeah right. e voting is now limited to biometric verification mm -hmm. for uh, a voter's identity but then the voting itself is done manually and the counting uh -huh. is done yeah. manually yeah. and that's what I upset the whole situation that we have now because yeah. even um the losing end was having this argument that at 10 o'clock they were winning and then all of a sudden there's this it dump changes. of um yeah. envelopes and it was like no that was a normal ballot somebody s sent it in by normal mail and i think that's what is confusing people in the sense that oh we didn't know that we can actually vote the normal way. So, so should should national entities like um, electoral commissions around the world be looking at who is behind um, the, the 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 building of these codes yeah. to see if people are not being sourced from around the world? Because sometimes you need the best brains, and they don't always come from the same, same country. Place, right? So, yeah, yeah. because companies are now basically virtual, mm -hmm. and there is the gig economy. Your company, for instance, um, Oswald, I'm sure, and yourself, mm -hmm. Josiah, um, your companies work with other people from other countries, countries you yes. know, because yeah. it's virtual, you yeah. have your virtual office. Yeah. And so I would imagine one of the best ways to um, counter some of these things is to invite um, people who do code to come into a sudden physical space yeah. owned by the government mm -hmm. to work where right. you have people who are vetted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah you, you, still need to, you need to look at uh, self-interest in, in among in that, that right, group that you've, the flip you've got. Side would be <laughs> the government who is, a, you know, I would say the current yeah. government would then be accused of building a system An that favors them. An incumbent government. Yeah, incumbent, right. So, so it yeah. will favor them in that sense. So I think there's always going to be somebody that would say, nah, this doesn't But then if you, have, if you have bodies like the CIA and right. the FBI and the MI5... I think, I, think they are, I, think, I think they are the worst people to trust to build an election <laughs> system because they are always um, political issues, interest all over, and some of these organizations are set up to push and pursue these interests. Right. So, so for that so matter, I it is best not to have um, anyone build anything no, to do with... I would say let's trust the technology, not the people. And every, uh, with technology, you can always verify. There are ways to audit technology. There's, there are ways to audit but electronically, code. electronically, there's no audit, really. No, it? no. I mean, you can actually look at do code reviews, okay. look at the builds, look at the servers, look at the way they are configured and everything, trying to find loopholes. You can get a firm, hire a firm, hire five firms across the world from but different locations. But how do you then make sure to that try these to hack firms... It. Yeah, but how do you make sure that these firms have... You know, the, um, integrity and everything that they do is so. Let's say, so let's say people. we let's let, let me just uh, cast okay. A, a, a um, give me a minute. Yeah? yeah, when we come back, we'll talk about verifying or verification for these companies that build these systems. Right. Yeah. And we're back. We're talking to um, our tech experts, our usual panelists, Oswald Anunadaga, CEO of Floodgates Limited, and um, Josiah Ayeson, CEO of iSpace Foundation. Um, Felix Daco is still on his way. We hope he gets here. But we're talking about verification for um, these companies that build e-voting systems.
Yeah, yeah. With uh, with elections, one of the most important things is transparency. So everybody needs to be able to know what's going on, and nothing should be hidden. And so the selection of these organizations and and everything should be public, and people should be allowed to come in, both opposition and incumbent right. should be allowed to come in to participate in this process and to choose. So let's say um, you have f firms that have been probably authorized across the world, and let's say you have maybe twenty or thirty of them. We build a system and then we task organizations to hack into the system. And then it can be real time because while people are working on their devices, you could actually display everything on the computer. So we But everything is hackable, isn't right. it? Everything, yeah. everything it's, is it's hackable. hackable but it's, it's difficult. But for it example, can be done. For example, we have a, a certain technology that we, are, we work with one of our international partners to build an identity solution. And even though it's hackable, it will take you about 75 years to actually um, crack it. And by then, the transaction would have expired. So even though it's hackable, it's possible that you can use uh, quantum computers at IBM to do it. It's going to take a very long time by, 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 by which it would be irrelevant. But it's 75 years on their side or 75 years on the other people's side? On anyone's side, I mean, wherever you are running it, it's going to take you about 75 years for you to decrypt that, um, that piece of And paper. how were you and able to come verifiable. up with that figure, 75 years? No, so there's, there's a runtime. So if you are able to, let's say I want to guess your password. There's a there's a, st a strategy called brute force attacking, and so I can decide to guess random words in the dictionary. So if you use uh, dog, book, car, any of them, I'm just going to run all the dictionary the words in the dictionary, and then run combinations and then run common passwords. It's called brute forcing. So you just try and try and try and try. Now every device, let's say a computer that is like maybe an i7 computer is able to run, let's, let's say, like 2,000 instructions or 2,000 tests per second. Then you can know how long it's going to take for it to do a full combination of all characters and numbers and all um, words in the dictionary, a combination of words and sentences, before it would be definitely get it. But if you are going to brute force, you will definitely be able to crack a password. It's going to take you a certain amount of time. And depending on the specs of the computer, it may take you a number of years or a number of minutes. Okay, so you're able to crack into um, one person's device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're able to get their password through this brute force thing. Yeah. All right. And then the... That's just, that's just one way. There are a lot of other ways to get it. But and I mean, the blockchain. The, and then yeah. the blockchain verifies you as an authentic person because your other peers would have been, you know, um, contacted, you know, yeah. digitally and they would have confirmed your identity. Yeah. So once you're in the system, you're in the system. A bit like that worm infestation we get, um, as in viruses. Yeah. Yeah. So, and um, so that won't take 75 years. No, no. That's why I said there are a lot of strategies. There are even social engineering techniques. Someone can make a call and talk to you and get you to, to, to release your information. There are phishing techniques where someone sends you an email, which is very it common. Looks like, yeah. It looks like you click a link and then download a virus to send your data they are, f they are actually um, applications called keyloggers, and those are the most dangerous ones because they sit on your computer and they record every keystroke. So within the day, let's say you log into all your accounts and your devices, it actually collects all the, everything you've typed and sends it to a server and then they get access to it and they can just log in as if it's you. I'm sure we're so, scaring people now. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's so, <laughs> so, so I guess, I guess um, you know, with this year, the EC has moved forward with its biometric voter registration drive and... Um, um, we are seeing people agreeing that perhaps it's it's the best way to 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 go about you know to verify a voter, yeah, verifying but a not voter, to vote, but not yeah. to vote, yeah. right? And so the biometric verification, a combination of a biometric um, verification and the physical voting um, using your ballot paper and the physical physical counting of your of your of your vote. Um, is um, or the, the 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 whole voting thing mm -hmm. is the best way to go. That's what we saw in the U.S. as well, and I think we're seeing that around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So I think the next step now is to solve the issue of identity management and identity. And when we have that unlock identity and security, we could actually look at pure electronic voting in the future. And what and as I'm saying, 
we can actually get people, organizations, businesses to come together and then run hackathons to create things, to build things, do a project, test different kinds of models and see. I don't see these things being done here. All we hear is something has been brought and it's available. Right, but it's not the fact that um, we don't have the people that can no, code no, this. Not, yeah, we do. That's, yeah. But then, again, you have to understand that people paying for these things mm -hmm. have a self-interest. See, so if... I mean, I'm not going to mention the names, but like um, the last previous elections, mm -hmm. we had another country that paid another company here mm -hmm. to build an, um, an election platform or whatever for them, right? Mm -hmm. So now that country that built that system for Ghana, they have their own self-interest. Yeah. So they're not going to be interested in using our developers to do that, yeah. right? And then also our government here, because of the by you know the partisan mentality that we have you're gonna you're not really gonna have coders that will invest themselves into national or social development programs like these yeah. but you're right we should be able to code these things ourselves yeah. even from testing it out from universities first exactly. see how it works exactly. and then use um you know regional voting yeah. um, elections to see how it works and then move it all the way up yeah. so yes we're not we're not at the top where we need to be but we have people that can do these things at a basic level. Yeah. Let's try them first. But because of partisan and also pay me before I do something. So are you saying that um, election voting systems are um, can be compromised because of um, partisan? Look, someone is in their office in um, North Korea. Uh -huh. All right. Um, just trying out their systems. Whether or not... Uh, partisan um, considerations went into the development of um, a system over here doesn't mean anything to them. They just want to test their hacking um, abilities. And so they're going to hack into it just to trial it out. Mm -hmm. All right. And so um, I don't see this argument holding water. And Felix Darko just walked in. And Hello. yeah, I'm sure he has something to say. You were listening to us in your of Uber, course. I'm sure. Um, Honestly, I think at the end of the day, what I find a lot more interesting is the part where you're hacking a human being and not um, a system, right? Um, I think that's what also a lot of cyber attackers have realized, uh, which is why that's what they did with the American election, right? They didn't try and go the brute force way of, of attacking the, the voting system, the election machines. Yeah. It's too much work and it's too overt, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go on Facebook... <clears throat> and you spread a bunch of mis misinformation about right. whatever candidate you're, you're for or against, you're able to sway the people to vote. So at the end of the day, you've accomplished your task without ever having to um, directly that's attack the, the social system. engineering thing we're talking exactly. about. Yeah, so it's a lot exactly. of fake news. Where So there was this video I saw um, recently. I mean, something that I, I, I understand has been planned somewhere, um, where people are actually extracting voices and putting... Similar voices or yeah. engineering yeah. the yeah. sound in Obama. a way yeah, Obama, that, right? you know, yeah. makes it yeah. sound yeah. like the person. And then they put it out there yeah. as just in, yeah. you know, we did our, yeah. our investigations and then yeah. this person said this or this person took this or that. Mm. But these are all fake news and yes, we have to exactly. deal with those things. Exactly. How do we verify those um, well, so there's, there's technical ways to do it or technology ways to do it. You can analyze footage and, and see whether or not it's been tampered with. Yeah. Uh, but now that you're using or we, we've been using deep fake technology, which is this AI that is able to sort of maybe so map artificial intelligence, artificial yeah. intelligence. Exactly. And you can either map somebody's face onto somebody else's head yeah. or map somebody's voice. Um, and so you can make a video that at least to the human eye looks very real. You, it's indistinguishable from um, sort of CGI or, or, or computer tricks, right? Yeah. And so you can spread misinformation, you can spread fake news about people doing crazy things or put, put them... I mean, this is a, a weird form to bring this up, but there's, there's been a slew of people photoshopping uh, uh, their, like, people they're trying to get revenge on onto like, pornographic videos and mm -hmm. using that as, as um, blackmail. Yeah. Right, so there's a lot of ways that you can you can manipulate you know modern technology to take advantage of people's brains rather than the technology that they use. Uh, so that's yeah. what we call social engineering. Yeah, and and I think that to deal with this, there should be a very massive campaign, especially maybe by um, the information ministry or some or and someone like that, to help to educate people and to you give examples. And so people should know that when you receive a voice note and it sounds like someone is speaking, it doesn't mean that that's the person. Yeah. Don't just void it everywhere and start saying certain things. Mm -hmm. And we need to show them examples of how people are able to copy voices and then 
create fakes and all of that do sa- same with the video experiences to show that you can take someone's face and put it on another and all that so we need to actually do a lot of information campaigns everybody should be involved in it anybody who understands tech should speak to people around them to let them understand that these things are possible and you shouldn't just run with information that you have all right this is crazy i mean this is so totally mad i mean um not only are we having problems with the biometric verification machines around the world we're also having tamperings with the votes that right. people do electronically mm-hmm. which has led um, electoral commissions around the world to use go back to the paper system and we also have the campaigning issue where people are um, sending out deep fake um, stories right. yeah so I mean we're almost at the end of our show and you've all got 30 seconds to chip in a last word before we go off. Let's begin with you, Oswald. So, um, to add up to uh, what Felix discussed, people should be wary what, uh, about social media. Uh, I definitely, I have actually been studying social media and the trends and the effects that it has. Social media is very powerful and these platforms are designed to keep your attention and to uh, manipulate your minds and cause behavioral change and cause you to be skewed a certain way and to think a certain way. So when you see things on social media, be careful how you spend your time on there. Be careful how you look at things, how you interpret the things that you see on there as well. All right, Josiah. I mean, for me, it might sound ridiculous, but for a tech person, I think we need to go back to the back to the days when we used to vote with marbles. <laughs> That's the easiest way to you give you a color marble, you know who it belongs to, you put it in a box. And then after the night, we count it and whoever wins, wins. You know what? Simple. I think I agree with you, Felix. <laughs> Um, I think going back to the topic of of fake news, um, you also see how governments have used the opposite, right? Where So instead of them creating fake news, they claim that something that is real is fake. Yeah. Um, And you see something like that at the um, Lekki toll booth shooting that happened in Nigeria. The government at first tried to blanket blanket it as a fake occurrence. So I think that we need to be wary on both sides, both from the government and from social media. All right. Thank you very much. It has been... um Aswasi Business BM, we've been talking about election technology. Today we spoke with our panelist, Oswald Anunadaga, CEO of Floodgates Limited, Felix Darko, tech expert, and Josiah Hasen, CEO of iSpace Foundation. It's been me, Prince Moses. We will see you again tomorrow. Bye.